We welcome you all to our Thursday convocation here at Monta Vista Grove. It's very special to have you here and your faithfulness in coming. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Reverend Wendy Tajima with us. And uh, she's chosen a scripture for us. It's from the Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Uh, and let me read that. Nehemiah, the eighth chapter. Uh, and they'll put it up on the screen for us, too. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those who have nothing is prepared for this day to the, our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites, still all the people, saying, Be quiet, the day, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make a great make great rejoicing as they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of the ancestral houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded Moses and that the Israelites should live in booths during the festival of the seventh month. And they should publish and proclaim in all their towns and in Jerusalem as follows. Go out to the hills, bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on the roofs of their houses and their courts and in courts of the houses of God. And in the square of the water gate and the square of the gate of Ephraim and all the assembly of those who re had returned from captivity made booths and lived in them. For from the day of Joshua, son of Nun, to that day, the Israelites had not done so. And there was a great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, Ezra read from the book of the, the law of God, and they kept the festival seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly, according to the ordinance. May God bless this understanding on our, of this word as we proceed through our time together. I like to also say uh, our opening prayer at this time. Let us pray. We thank you, God, that you have provided this opportunity for us to have Wendy Tajima here to share uh, her thoughts and understanding and help us as we seek to be faithful servants in all that we do. Pray for those refugees and other people around the world that are seeking to have help at this time. And we pray for refugees in this country as well as around the world. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> it's now a privilege to have uh, Reverend Tajima uh, take over at this point, and Wendy. Thank you, Bryce. I actually can't see a whole bunch of you, but hopefully you'll, uh, you can see me. Um, and uh, apparently we have a, a tech host, Tyler, and he did what we've learned about Tyler right before this is that he does karaoke at night. So if it gets boring, we're going to kick it over to him and then he's <laughs> going to take over. We'll do some singing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having me. And I, I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm just the, the hometown girl, so I'm not sure why I was invited to do this, um, except that I think uh, in many ways I am Bryce's successor because I have, um, benefited so much and San Gabriel has benefited so much from his example. So when he asked me to come to this, then I thought that it would be a, a, a nice opportunity to do some sharing. Uh, I, it, 
this is going to be pretty casual, informal. And so I wanted to just uh, share some thoughts about where I think we're at or how I see the church from my vantage point. And uh, you're welcome to add in some chat, some questions, comments, um, and I will probably stop before the end of the hour so that we can um, hear from you if you have any um, things that you would like us to follow up on. So just to introduce myself a little bit, um, as I said, I am a hometown girl. I, I was born and raised at, in Pasadena in San Gabriel Presbytery. And in many ways, I kind of feel like a bridge person, somebody who has been in between two different things. Um, for instance, I am a cradle Presbyterian, um, but right this moment, I seem to be surrounded by new Presbyterians, by people who have not actually joined the denomination um, until very recently. I am also Japanese American. I'm third generation Japanese American. And what that means is that sometimes um, I am confused as uh, Caucasian by Caucasian people and also by new immigrants. Some new immigrants will come to, uh, to me or to other Japanese Americans to try to interpret uh, what it means to be American. And yet I know that I am a generation away from the internment camps. And so it's very real to me that I am not um, Caucasian, I'm not dominant culture. Uh, I also realized, and this is something I'll probably want to talk a little bit more about, that um, I am also in between generations. I am a young baby boomer. I was just saying to Bryce that I'm not only the youngest in my among my sisters, I'm the youngest on both sides of my cousins. And uh, my niece says that I'm the cool aunt. <laughs> I like that. And I said, well, why do you think I'm a cool aunt? She goes, well, you know, because like you work for Apple computer and, you know, you know some things, but I know that I'm really challenged with some new things, especially I noticed for myself, I don't know what, what, when you figured out that you were not a child anymore, I figured it out when I started hearing about marijuana being sold at convenience stores and gender fluidity. That's when I realized um, I kind of got off the train of coolness. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at. But I, as I mentioned, I'm not, I, I, I wanted to just share a little bit about what, what I've been observing in the church, especially in the Presbyterian church from the place of Southern California. But I uh, was wondering if you all were a little curious about the scripture passage that I asked Bryce to read. Um, I've been thinking a lot about where we are as uh, people in the midst of a whole lot of change and maybe even people who've been yearning for things to get back to normal. And I thought, is there any kind of biblical precedent for that? And I thought about Nehemiah. And, you know, for us in the Presbyterian church, especially, you know, for decades now, actually, we have been struggling to let go of our reliance on the trappings of privilege as the Presbyterian church. We are so privileged as a denomination that we even have privilege amongst the privilege of the North American mainline mm -hmm. denominations. Um, we and the Episcopalians are the two groups that tend to have the most resources at hand. Um, so because of that, we have tended to take for granted permanence, strength, predictability, and safety. And so in that, of course, just like the, the Israelites, they took great um, comfort in the idea of the temple. And we take great comfort in the sense of the PCUSA as this strong, unchanging institution. However, the call of most people in the world, the most people of God, they're being called to remain faithful in the reality of impermanence, of mortality, of uncertainty and risk. And uh, you may, I, I know that I've noticed this when I go to different neighborhoods and you'll see if you visit a city that is affluent, you can visit that city year to year and it's fairly similar. Things stay fairly similar or they get nicer. If you go to a neighborhood that's at risk or marginalized, you'll see that the businesses change over every year or they get, or the buildings go downhill. Um, and you'll just notice that there's something about um, not having the privilege that 
makes you more uncertain and more at risk of change. So I was thinking about booths because I love this idea of booths as a motif. As you remember, uh, Nehemiah came because the people who were exiled had come back to Jerusalem and they rushed to build the second temple so they could get that sense that they were back to normal and things were okay and the permanence that had been reestablished. They had just been taken away to Babylon, and so they were um, experiencing that vulnerability and that sense of homelessness. And so they desperately wanted things to go back to that sense of um, home. And I thought about that, that uh, frankly, I think it's a little bit of an error to think that the temple was the home of God, right? Um, and God, in fact, says to them, I am a nomadic God. You cannot confine me to, this, to these bricks. And so when we also rely on grand structures and a strong institution, we may not be recognizing what God's call is and where most of the world is living. And most of the world is living in a place of impermanence and homelessness and transience and change. And uh, so many people are living in booths right? Many people are living in tents. They're not living in grand castles. And that seems very scary and risky and unfortunate for us. It also means that they are more agile and possibly more resilient. And most definitely, they are much more aware of their reliance on God. Hmm. So some lessons that we have learned, because for us, our exile was, of course, COVID. And no matter how many years we've been trying to tell each other in the Presbyterian Church and in all the mainline churches that we need to adjust to change, we need to adapt to change, we need to do things differently, we need to go online, we need to figure out how to be more faithful. And we really couldn't do any of that. So COVID did it for us. And COVID immediately got us to understand and to focus on the essence of church. And it, it was so quick that people immediately realized that worship was number one, caring for people were number two. And then once those got established, caring for the community was number three. And as I would often joke as an ex-stated clerk, polity pretty much went out the window because we really needed to focus on what was essential to the church. And what was essential was worshiping our God and staying connected as a people. We also learned that we were much more resourceful and imaginative than, and adaptive than we thought we were. We also realized that we had resources. We had resources in each other and frankly, in our savings accounts. And living in the United States, we actually were able to tap resources in the United States and learn to use those resources. Um, we tend to be a fairly frugal people and we tend to take very good care of our finances and yet, the Synod showed great uh, generosity in open-handedly just saying to each presbytery, here's $150,000, figure out what to do with it. And San Gabriel in turn went to our churches and, and actually we were able to give three different kinds of grants to churches. Um, one of them was for technology. One of them was just to help them and let them know that we're there. And then we also came across as we were touching base with our churches, we found that especially our immigrant churches and especially our Latino churches had people who were undocumented and the folks who were immigrants and undocumented immediately fell to the bottom of the list when it came to um, people who were in need. And so we were able to get a grant to help, with, help them with that. One of the things that I noticed immediately and wish that we could, we could hold on to is the understanding of the confining impact of perfectionism. Hmm. As a church, we have been so limited by never, want, never wanting to risk making a mistake. And we have really a dependence, maybe even a, an addiction to stability. COVID took all of that away. And when we realized that we could survive and we could even stumble, but still manage to be faithful, I was hoping that that would be a good lesson for us, that we could continue to do things that we never did before and we didn't know how to do, but with God's help, we would manage to do it. 
One thing that I also uh, think that we all learned, and we were a little, we some of us didn't understand this, and that was the debilitating impact of isolation, and how much the church really was community for many people, and we didn't, we just took it for granted. And so that's something that we are still understanding is just how difficult that can be when people have been isolated. We also, COVID also revealed cracks in society. Um, you know, they say that when there's a crisis in a family, you come to understand where the weaknesses in the family are. We also came to understand the weaknesses in society, especially the disparities in healthcare and between the classes. Uh, and also uh, there was a much stronger awareness of the reality of racism. And that actually became a time for uh, several of us old anti-racism warriors to really, it was frankly, it was an opportunity for us to step in and to address some things that um, became much more clear to folks than they were before. One thing that uh, has been happening since COVID has kind of waned a little is uh, whether or not we're gonna be able to go back to normal or whether in fact we have to adapt to the fact that there will always be a time of uncertainty. I actually spent uh, my first years in uh, ministry were in Hawaii and I was doing a lot of church transformation consultations. And one of the things that we kept trying to explain to people was that church transformation did not mean you do some studies and you develop a mission study and that's your new destination. And that's what you're gonna be for the next 20 or 30 years. What in fact ha is happening nowadays is things are constantly changing. And so it's not so much about finding the new destination, it's about learning how to just stay on the move and finding your stability, even when things are constantly changing. One example of that, um, that's actually not that different from the idea of booths. So I lived in Hawaii for 10 years and I actually lived, well, some of the time was in the city, but I always lived in a house. And one time um, I, I needed to have a cable installed. And so the person came and they kind of almost like just took their finger and put their finger through the wall. <laughs> that was how, how small uh, and thin and, and frankly flimsy the architecture was. And I had talked to some people about that and they said, well, you know, when you live in a place that is regularly visited by storms, tsunamis and volcanoes, you don't spend a huge amount of time putting a lot of money into houses that might go by the wayside hmm. on a regular basis. And so they tended to not have that kind of separation between inside and outside. Hmm. Uh, because they just knew that it was it could go at any minute, so why bother? I remember also a, a Native American indigenous uh, teacher who talked about the importance of preparation and how you have to prepare ahead of time. And he kept talking about preparation. And for me, at least, when I hear preparation, I hear, you know, have everything set and have everything planned out so that you know what to do. And then at the end, he said, you need to prepare because you always need to be ready for change. And so what he was talking about was preparing for change, hmm. which is quite different than I think the way we tend to look at things. In fact, uh, some of you know that we have a new worshiping community that uh, borrows from the Black church tradition and Black theology, Black Christian theology. And one time I just said in passing that um, one way you can know kind of a, a Black church's uh, theology, one shorthand way would to, is to say life is hard, but thank God, God is good. Mm. But when you're in privilege, sometimes you actually will say, if life is hard, is God good? You know, we have this kind of conditional faith that we believe in God only as long as God behaves the way we want, as opposed to many people who know that the world is just a really difficult place. But we rely on God who is going to help us through those difficulties. So as I think about the PCUSA, I see that we are going through some major changes. As an example, uh, some of us have talked about the way that we have the polity and we have an organization in the church, 
And much of what we have now got developed back in the 50s and, and before. And it was, frankly, it was a way to manage the growth of the baby boom. Because what you had with the baby boom, especially in Southern California, is you had a lot of people coming into Southern California. They were having a lot of babies. They were still churchgoers. And so you had them all going into the church. And the churches had to figure out how to manage having this explosion of growth. The problem is that now we're at a time where we're post-Christendom, post-baby boom. And so we don't need to manage or control growth anymore. We need to figure out how to spur growth and inspire growth and help help whatever growth we see. Um, one of the first ways we did that many years ago, and I see Dave Tomlinson is here so he can remember this, is that we did the new form of government. You remember several years ago, the, the, the book of order was totally rewritten and it was made much, much thinner. And the thinking was that we would go from a one size fits all church to a everything is going to be contextual church. And so there weren't so many shared common rules for the denomination and the presbyteries for the most part were the ones who were supposed to figure things out for themselves based on our particular situation. What that did, and it, it even scared me. I remember once being in a meeting with Charles Marx and I, and when it was first being introduced and we were thinking, oh my God, no Presbytery is gonna be like any other Presbytery. And in fact, that has become a little bit true. You cannot assume that the way we do things is the way the Presbytery next door or the Presbytery in Pennsylvania does things. Mm -hmm. And that actually has made for a, a lot more complexity, but obviously a lot more flexibility. Mm -hmm. The other thing that has happened in the church is um, we have gone through a season of dismissals. We are in a season of dissolutions, but we're also in a season of new worshiping communities. And what we've noticed is having a polity that was assuming that there would always be growth and there would always be churchgoers meant that the polity assumed a fairly stable church. The problem that we have right now is that we don't have practices or guidelines for the death and new life of churches. And so frankly, a lot of it is we're making things up as we go along. Um, I actually want to give a shout out to San Fernando Presbytery because they actually have done a lot to try to figure out how to how to work through or get around the polity um, to, to help with new worshiping communities because there are several ways that it just isn't fitting, it isn't working for us um, the way the polity works for now. Um, here's one example. One example is new worshiping communities cannot make new members because they're not a congregation. And so you have a lot of new people coming into the Presbyterian church and maybe even wanting to get involved, but we won't let them. And that's one of the uh, things that, and so, and then we also won't let them become ruling elders because they're not a member. And so they can't come into leadership. And that this is an area where San Fernando Presbytery has really been pushing. And at the last general assembly, there was a, quite a bit of acknowledgement of that. Another area that we are looking at and in new ways is what we do with property, how we form pastors, and what kinds of partnerships can we, can we create. Um, especially in Southern California, as I mentioned to a lot of people, uh, you know, pretty much the, the, the church's greatest assets are the gospel, the people, and the property. And so how we manage the property and how we do that for the sake of mission um, is, is actually a growing concern. And it's one that actually within San Gabriel Presbytery, we've already done a lot of work on. And we're now moving into a new chapter of not just what to do with the property for income generation or what to do with the property for um, church, for the church's congregational work, but also how do we partner and use property for things like affordable housing or temporary housing for refugees and asylum seekers. So there's con continuing growth in our understanding of what to do with property. 
uh, with pastors, especially our presbytery. I actually had to look this up because I keep saying this to people and people always look at me. I always say that we're the most promiscuous, uh, the most promiscuous presbytery <laughs> in the denomination. <laughs> and the reason is we have so many special needs because there are not that many uh, uh, Mandarin speaking pastors, or we don't have a lot of sub, a lot of Latino pastors who are progressive, or you know we we have a lot of different um, needs in our presbytery, and so we have often ended up partnering with uh, pastors from other denominations or people who grew up non Presbyterian, and so we've got to figure out how to get them Presbyterian really fast, <laughs> and this is actually a. a, a, a exercise in pastoral formation that we're still working out. Mm -hmm. We're constantly trying to figure out what is essential to pastors. As an example, what we've learned is one of the number one things is they have to know how to respect the authority of ruling elders. That seems to be one of the biggest issues that we, we find. Um, but, you know, so what are the essentials of being, and, and frankly, we also try to get them to understand what the presbytery is. So, you know, certain things that we want to make sure they understand as we also um, try to be gracious and flexible about other things like whether their MDiv comes from a Presbyterian seminary or not, that kind of thing. The last thing I will also mention about the PCUSA, and this is actually my own experience, and my own experience as a person of color who tends, who has managed to, at times, it seems like I'm, I'm knocking on the door of the inner sanctum of the denomination. And there are a couple of ways that this has happened actually um, fairly frequent, uh, recently, in fact. Um, for instance, uh, I didn't know this until just this last year that there is a, a leadership formation program training uh, new executive presbyters. Okay. And I did not know that for years, there has been a fight trying to get me onto the faculty of that training program. And what I found out when they finally relented and, and let me be part of the training program was that for years there was a fight because there were people who apparently considered me to be dangerous or, or somehow not trustworthy to train mm. new execs. Mm. Mm. Uh, the other uh, area is that I'm currently um, the Southern California Commissioner on the General Assembly Permanent Judicial Commission. So the Supreme Court of the denomination. And that in fact has, uh, has, is quite uh, interesting right now because it's really possibly the most diverse body in the denomination, um, except they're not diverse in terms of education. They're all highly educated people, but they're coming from Latino, Native American, Korean, uh, black, every different, um, not every, but a lot of different perspectives. And what that has done is we have been challenging the old timers to bring into consideration things that are new to the Presbyterian church. And frankly, also questioning things that had always been considered valuable and a good priority among Presbyterians. So it's been an interesting thing for me to kind of be like, I, I really sometimes feel like I'm leaven <laughs> because I'm actually like bringing in things that people don't really necessarily want to hear, but God willing, and, and they've actually been pretty gracious about listening once they're forced to. Um, now, if I were to think about the presbytery, about this presbytery, San Gabriel, and I see some of you are members of San Gabriel, so thank you for being part of, uh, part of this family. Um, but we are known in the denomination in a couple of ways. And probably the way that most people think about us is through our diversity. Um, but the, the thing about us is it's, it's true that we're diverse. It's true that we have, you know, half of our membership are people of color. More than half of our churches can be considered immigrant churches or with significant immigrant congregations. Uh, we, I, I think the last, I think we spelt, we, worship in nine languages every Sunday. Um, 
But the thing that I, I think about is not so much that we have all of these different people, but that we are actually becoming more intercultural in terms of having the diversity impact the way we be presbytery, how we do presbytery. So as I mentioned about them being flexible about how we find leaders for these different congregations, um, we have a strategy around pastoral leadership and church planting. And it's very important to us that not only do we have the numbers, but we bring them into to the leadership table so that they're actually impacting and guiding the way uh, we, we live out our, our, presbytery, our presbytery life. Uh, we also um, have done some old fashioned things like learned how to live out the trust clause. And the trust clause, of course, is, is a very old element of the Presbyterian church, but it's a challenging one because basically it says to our congregations, you have this property entrusted to you for only as long as you are relevant to your community. And if you are not able to bring the gospel in a relevant way to your community, you need to come to us and figure out what to do about that. And this presbytery, in, unlike any presbytery I know, the churches know that. And they actually will raise their hand and say, we need help. We need to do something or we need to find partners who will help us. And frankly, I actually uh, thank Bryce Little and some of, and Karen Kaiser and some of our, our um, former pastors for helping them to understand that. A couple of other things that I will mention is that we are, we have multiple women of color and multiple women in leadership. Um, Somehow we woke up one day and realized that most of our larger churches have uh, women as heads of staff. And uh, that's actually unusual still. And you are probably the only presbytery that has had two women of color in a row be your executive. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there has been that openness uh, to diversity that in leadership that is important. We are actually diverse enough, I love this, that we're kind of like lapping around. And so for instance, we have a Latino congregation in Highland Park, and they know that there are a lot of Caucasian hipsters who are moving in. So they've been trying to figure out how to develop an English ministry for these new hipsters who are moving into Highland Park, even though they're a Spanish speaking congregation. So, you know, we, 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 we kind of like, we open up the eyes of the rest of our sisters and brothers in the, in the denomination. <laughs> what all of this means, though, is in order for us to actually be a family of people, of, of all the people, not just a group of people serving everyone else, is that we have to change the way we do things. And so we've had some really good discussions and implemented some new practices that help us live into the diversity and getting, get more people to the table. I, don't, I think I may have mentioned to you that, so half of our people are people of color, half of our members, but we have worked hard to get more diversity in our leadership as well. So about 40% of our leaders are people of color, um, which is, is pretty good. And a couple of ways that we have um, addressed this and, and, be, and the ways that we've become more intentional about being a diverse community. One is that because we can't translate for all of the different languages and frankly, even new Presbyterians and some younger people who don't know the Roberts rules real well, they're really intimidated by um, the Presbytery plenary. And so what we have been doing is more of the decisions, and in fact, Dave as the moderator has made comments about this. Most of our decisions get done at the committee and commission level. And a lot of really good work gets done that way. And that's better because people for whom English is a second language or they're new to the Presbyterian church, they're more able to contribute and to discuss things at a committee level than to get on the floor of Presbytery. And then what has happened is we, there's enough trust in the presbytery that what is like 99% of the votes are 99% are affirmative. So really the work of this presbytery are, be done, are being done in those smaller groups where we can have people who, where there's, there's time for them to say, 
can you explain that to me? I don't understand what you're saying about that. Or this is the way that I'm hearing you. And, you know, we're able to bring people into, into leadership in a much more realistic way. The other thing that I, I've been mentioning to people lately, because this was like a major aha moment for one of my colleagues back East, is our, we, we have been managing to do this. And this is a, a practice we're hoping to keep up with, is our COM has members from at least four or five of the other languages. So, so we actually, I realized it's actually six languages that we have in our COM at any given time because most of us are limited to English, but then we will always strive to have somebody who speaks Spanish, who speaks Korean, who speaks Arabic. And then we're able to cheat because if we can get a Taiwanese person, they always speak Taiwanese and Mandarin. So we, we have, um, so actually, no, it's, is it five, mm -hmm. six languages? Anyway, so, th so that we're able to communicate because COM really is, is the, the commission where um, a lot of decisions get made and a lot of churches are really at the mercy of whether the presbytery understands them or not. So that's something that we have committed to. I will tell you that our, our biggest challenge continues to be um, age diversity. Um, we are blessed with, you know, and I've always said this, that one of the great blessings of being here in San Gabriel is Monte Vista Grove. Um, and we have several retirement communities and we have chaplains. Um, I don't know if you all have heard that Harlan Redmond is going to join Diane Frazier to be a chaplain working with Monte Vista Grove. So we're really excited mm. about that. Okay. Um, but we we and we have more younger pastors. We have pastors into their 30s, but we haven't, we are not strong in terms of youth programs and children's ministries. And so that's something that that I know that I have kind of a blind spot because I don't have children. Um, but that's something that I know that we we really need to be looking at. So I'm going to end with just a few suggestions of what I see as needed changes in the denomination. Um, and, and then we can open up for anybody who has uh, questions or comments or want to explore more some of these topics. One of the key issues that I see are the expectations of congregations, especially the expectations of sessions and how, what the assumptions that the denomination makes about what makes a viable congregation. As I think I may have mentioned, we're in a season of dissolutions and there are a few, um, you know, there, there have been several churches that have come to us and said, we cannot continue this way. And the interesting thing about the Presbyterian church is it's not usually because of money. It's not that they're running out of money. What they're running out of is people mm -hmm. who can do be elders on session and sessions who can do everything that book, the book of order expects them to do. Mm -hmm. And the other is taking care of the property. Those are the two areas. Those are usually the two ways that people say we're in trouble. Um, my joke is that, you know, if you, this, we're, we're in a denomination where you have to have a master's degree to understand the polity. <laughs> and so you, if you get more and more elders who did not grow up Presbyterian, it's very difficult for them to meet all of the requirements, let alone understand all the requirements in the book of order. The other issue is that um, there is an assumption that the membership will be stable enough, committed enough, and affluent enough that their offerings will pay for the ministry of the church. And if we are to move into certain communities, or if we were to work, or if we were to work primarily with, for instance, millennials now who don't have stable incomes and don't stay in one place for very long, we have to figure out other income sources for the churches because the members are not able to afford to pay for the way we want to be church. As I mentioned, there's a challenge as we develop uh, new worshiping communities in terms of pastoral leadership. One of my big beefs is that the book of uh, the board of pensions has a firewall between what they will offer to ordain ministers of the word and sacrament in the Presbyterian church and anybody else, even people who are full-time pastors for churches, 
cannot get the same benefits. Mm -hmm. and, and then, as I mentioned, the fact that people cannot be members um, if they're a part of the new worshiping community, there's just certain ways that our polity just isn't yet catching up with the new worshiping communities. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that um, we that is kind of brewing in the back of everybody's heads, and that is a pretty fundamental shift, and that is going to happen as more of the ministry is virtual versus physical. Um, we there are already churches in the denomination that are fully virtual; they have no building. They never worship in person. They have members who they've never met in person. And there are certain, you know, and there's kind of an, maybe even unspoken assumption that the ministry of a church is geographically based. And the mission of that church is focused on the local community around the church. Mm -hmm. And that if a member moves far enough away, they should be joining a church in the community that they've moved to. With nowadays, that's not happening. We have people uh, who are members of some of our churches who live in Texas and Arizona. They're serving on session from Texas or Arizona. We have folks who, um, you know, are are looking at churches without a community uh, without a building, and then we have to figure out what to do with the buildings. We don't know. I don't know personally how this is going to impact jurisdiction when you have people, because mm -hmm. again, we have tended to focus on this geography, mm -hmm. the geographic basis of presbyteries and membership. I also have started to wonder about um, even like, you know, how we, we, there's a lot of discussion about journalism. Of course, my father was a journalist um, and what is happening with the local press right, with local newspapers mm -hmm. as they start to go down, mm -hmm. everything becomes nationalized. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question for us is if we start to be more intermingled uh, virtually as churches, will we still have a commitment to these local neighborhoods? And what does that look like? And what does it look like to be a member of a church where you've actually never stepped foot in the church or met, any, met your pastor in person? There, it's something that I, just like the gender fluidity thing, it's something that I, 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 I that's kind of, it, it, it's such a, it's such a deep uh, assumption that we make in the way we think about church that I'm not yet sure how that's going to sort out. So I think I'm going to stop there um, and see if anybody has questions or comments that, um, and I'm not seeing a chat in a, my window, so somebody may hopefully can call it out. Bill, Craig? Oh, Wendy. Yeah. It has been deeply moving to hear you and the expanse that you have covered it is just really something. Um, for the tabernacle God, not the temple God, uh, trying to move back into this post-Christendom era mm -hmm. of reaching out and, and so forth. We Presbyterians are not that good at evangelism, <laughs> but you encourage me so much. And um, this has just been grand to, to hear you. Could I ask with the worshiping communities, new worshiping communities that you have in San Gabriel, I think you've told us about a couple of them. Uh, could you give us uh, more, a couple of more anecdotal uh, impressions about how that's going and so forth? Sure. Uh, so, so one of the things that I will say is we're, you know, every, again, every Presbytery is different. So um, our, our approach is kind of a hybrid of old fashioned strategy and mission planning as well as trying to be open to uh, the opportunities and what God provides to us. So for instance, um, we have had for several years now, the Presbytery has had the hope of um, establishing a, a church that celebrates and, and honors and respects 
and utilizes the gifts of the Black church tradition. Even if the church is multiracial in its membership, we really want to see the traditions of the Black church continued in this area. This actually came out of the um, the grief that we had over having to close South Hills, which was the last Black church that we had in, in this presbytery. And so we set aside funds and waited and looked for a leader who could, who could carry that forward. And so that is what we're so thrilled about um, with Interwoven, um, is having somebody who has been uh, for many years now dedicated to uh, community development in Northwest Pasadena. He himself is African-American from New Orleans. Um, but through the foresight of the San Marino church, they saw him, saw his potential, grabbed him, made him a member, and then sent him to Princeton. So now he's back and um, he actually has been doing some really excellent work. But what's interesting about him, and, and South Hills knew this way back when they closed, was they needed not just somebody who knew the Black church tradition, but could speak it for a new generation. And so Harlan is that mix. He knows the traditions. He has that way about him, the style, the understanding, the appreciation for gospel music. Um, but he's also very progressive, very inclusive, very forward thinking, especially around women in ministry and, and people of all um, backgrounds and also very strong in econo economic development for his people. Mm -hmm. So that's one, of the, that's one of the goals and the hopes that we have. Another goal um, that we have had, um, though it kind of shifted, was uh, there has been a desire in a couple of the communities. We have a couple, we have many, several communities that are Asian, more Asian American. And so we've had a couple of communities where we were hoping for a uh, next generation Asian American church. Um, because many Asian Americans, they intermarry, they don't speak the language of their, of their ancestors. They're American, but they're also Asian. And so we have tried a couple of different ways to address that. And the most recent is in Temple City. And we have a young, um, really gifted young Indonesian American uh, uh, pastor who is partnering with one of our older churches and they and he has a vision for uh, reaching out to young second generation. Um, he calls them second generation immigrants. I keep thinking, well, they're not immigrants if they're second generation, but they're but they come. They still have that understanding of being from an immigrant immigrant background. And so he's just started with them, um, but he actually already has a group of a very diverse group of people um, who he's working with. So that's in Temple City. It doesn't have a name. They don't want to name it until they've gotten a little bit more traction and then they can, they can develop a name among themselves. So we just call it a new worshiping community in Temple City. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, church that is classifies as a new worshiping community, but it's one that people, it's kind of the way that many of our churches have come into this presbytery. They, um, are an Indonesian church. They were already established as a church, but they did not have a denominational connection in the United States, even though they are connected with GKI, which is a denomination in Indonesia. And so they actually approached us and uh, we've been working with them to uh, learn more. They're, they're, I don't know if you know about Indonesia, but you know there's very strong reformed roots there already. So they actually understood a lot of the Presbyterian system and it's really just making an adjustment and having them um, uh, develop into a church that is a chartered church in the denomination. There's uh, two more churches, more two more ideas. One of them hasn't been public yet, but it's so it's just brewing in the back of our minds. And that is one where um, there's a woman who is certified ready and she has had been a strong leader in uh, the center for the center for Pacific Asian for the for the Pacific Asian family, which is a shelter. It's actually a domestic violence agency among Asian Americans in Southern California. Um, and so she is uh, developing a faith based group model for families of of Asian daughters 
and wanting to help with um, help them to understand the Christian faith as one that empowers and values young Asian girls. And as an old Asian girl, I can tell you that that's really important. Um, there, I, I can, I can, my most colorful stories in ministry was, were the several times in my CPM process when I was likened to a prostitute, mm -hmm. because that's the main, that's the dominant uh, image of Asian women in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so she, so, so that's a really interesting thing. She's just starting that out. So it's not really public. And then the other one that is also just starting out is, um, for families of, uh, especially I, I, there really, it grew out of, um, conservative Christian families who had, uh, gay children and didn't know what to do mm -hmm. or, conservative Christians who, when they came to terms with being gay, were ostracized by their families and their churches. Yeah. And so this ministry is really one of healing and restoration for, um, for people who have been uh, dismissed by their families or by their churches and, and had always known that they love God. And now they're looking for a family of God who will love them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are the those are the groups that are active right now. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I want to ask too. <clears throat> Juan Sarmiento is the new EP for uh, San Fernando, which is my presbytery. Um, how do you get together as EPs and share and and uh, learn and plan together? Mm -hmm. Well, so so the EPs in Southern California meet on a monthly, almost bi monthly, every two months. But Juan and I actually meet much more frequently than that. Um, I, I always say that uh, uh, San Fernando and San Gabriel are two presbyteries with a very permeable border between them. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, we, there have been several different ways where we have partnered with each other, transferred churches and pastors back and forth between and or allowed churches to worship in each other's um, uh, geographic areas. Um, so as an example, uh, one of the churches, or there's a couple of churches, but one that's best known as New Abbey. And New Abbey is a church that has been in partnership with San Fernando, but they're in Pasadena, but I know the pastor yeah. really well. And so we do, we, you know, I'm, I'm, and I've learned a lot actually from Corey, from the, the pastor at New Abbey. Interwoven, where Harlan Redmond is, is currently worshiping in La Cunada Presbyterian Church. Oh. Oh. So we, we, we go, we coordinate actually. And in fact, Juan and I, this is one that we're praying for. I'm almost afraid to say it out loud, but Juan and I have been talking quite regularly about this one church that is doing fabulous work. And right now they don't have a denominational home and we've been like trying to get them to come <laughs> into the Presbyterian church. <laughs> we, we will join you in prayer uh, for that unnamed church. And uh, thank you. Uh, we are so grateful for your leadership. You're, we are blessed to have you. And thank you for your, spending your time with us, uh, old folks here at the Grove. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Other questions? Any other I'm going to, we only have a few minutes, so I'm just going to, the, the last thing I'm going to say is, um, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we, we, we really try to be a big tent presbytery. Um, and so we, we value the creativity of God and creating a lot of different people. And that actually means that we're going to, we're going to uh, partner with people who don't have not in the past um, been as friendly with each other. Let me put it that way. Um, in fact, as I, 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 as I mentioned, this church that works with, um, with LGBTQ folks, um, it, and, and I remember when I first brought it up, and there were a couple of folks who I could tell were a little uncomfortable about that. And I said, don't worry about it. The next church we're bringing in is really conservative. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so there, you know, we're, we're, we're really wanting to be a welcoming place 
And, and as I just mentioned this to a new person in the, in the presbytery, that kind of the rules that we have for them is we want to be a big tent. We want to learn from each other. We want to understand that God is much bigger than what any of those see. The only rule is that you need to respect the fact that there are going to be other people in this presbytery who, you know, who um, uh, or may not be similar to you, but you have to respect them and, and, uh, and not, con- not be condemning of each other. So, so we have this issue about race, we have sexual minorities, we have citizenship status and language, generation, as I mentioned, theological perspective, as I mentioned. The, other, um, the two other areas that I would love for us to look at are um, physical abilities and neurodivergence and mental ability. So that's one, that's a huge area because you know, everybody is challenged in a different way. Uh, and then the other that the big unspoken thing in the United States is class. And, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of assumptions the Presbyterian Church makes based on our relative affluence. So, You use the term people of color. Who do you include in that group? Everybody who doesn't consider themselves Caucasian. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm running out of time. Yes. So should I turn it over to Bryce? That's fine. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, uh, for your helpful uh, explanations of kind of where the Holy Spirit is leading us uh, in our Presbytery of San Gabriel and other Presbyteries here across the country. Um, I just want to mention next week, uh, we will be uh, having... Uh, Dr. Christopher uh, Matthew, that it's the Matthew son, who is a professor at the University in Lund, Sweden. And he'll be speaking to us and giving us a lot of understanding from the perspective of Scandinavia and his background and tradition. So I want to thank uh, Wendy a lot, Wendy, for your sharing and, and seeing what's happening. It really makes me excited and glad about all the good things that are happening in the presbytery and uh, at this point uh, are there any other questions that you have but I think we'll wrap it up we're at the closing time so let's just have a word of closing prayer thank you God for this time with Wendy uh, Tajima and what you're doing in the life of the presbytery in her church and what you're challenge us to do Help us to respond to the promptings of your Holy Spirit that we may be faithful in sharing and receiving the gospel. In Christ's name we pray, amen. That's it. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. And uh, I want to give a hand. Uh, Tyler has been substituting today over at San Marino handling on things. So let's give our appreciation to, uh, to Tyler. And thank you very much. So we're all set. We'll see you next week, next Thursday at four o'clock. Thank you.